I think white people are the only race of people that like to be scared for fun. <laughs> like, you feel me? Not an attack, doesn't make you bad, makes you interesting. <laughs> but not bad, but bungee jumping, skydiving, swimming with sharks, these are torture tactics. <laughs> Some of you pay for them. That's a curveball. I just think white people get to have a different relationship with fear. It doesn't make anyone bad, I just think it's an interesting observation. White people can have a different relationship with fear. Like, I think white people are the only people you could walk up to and just be like, hey, you want to do something scary today? And y'all will just outright say no. <laughs> you feel me? You'll be like, well, what do you got in mind? <laughs> you feel me? But like, you go to anybody of another race, they're like, fuck no. <laughs> but like, white people have follow-up questions sometimes. They're like, well, what are you thinking? <laughs> okay. Look at roller coasters, right? Theme park owners know white people love being scared so much, you'll pay for a picture of your own face terrified. <laughs> that's their business model. That's how reliable it is. They were like, yeah, that's where we're gonna get the rest of the money. <laughs> I've been in so many white homes and seen a framed picture <laughs> of the entire family terrified. Why? Why is that even a thing? I haven't been in one black family's home and seen a picture of four black people absolutely terrified. And they're like, yeah, that's the time I got stuck up at gunpoint right there. That's us. This is where I tried to sell my kids for my own life. So wild to me, man. And understand what I'm saying, because I understand I'm generally speaking, right? I'm speaking in generalities. I understand there are special case scenarios for everything. So please, like, I'm not being irresponsible with this. Just be on the same page with me. I'm just saying, generally speaking, though, that kind of holds true. <laughs> I'm saying, generally speaking, I feel like white people feel fear so rarely that y'all schedule it as a vacation activity. <laughs> Like, you feel what I'm saying? Like, literally put it on a schedule. You're like, at 12, we're gonna have lunch. At one, we're gonna pet a tiger. You're like, what the fuck are you talking about? A tiger? Huh? You know what no one black has ever said to me? I wanna go on a safari. <laughs> Not once. I got so many black friends, no one's ever wanted to go. It's our country, and we're like, nah. <laughs> But I have so many white friends that want to go. Doesn't make them bad, I'm just saying it's an interesting difference that you can spot and go, oh shit, okay. Why doesn't the safari sound insane to everybody? I didn't realize it was something we were so like polarized on. I thought we were all of the same mind, like that's fucking crazy. And apparently we don't agree. I never understood like why it isn't crazy. You wanna go to the zoo without the walls? That's what we wanna do? You want to take away my favorite part of the zoo? <laughs> the part where they can't get me? That, that's what we're taking away? Oh, all right. <laughs> Every time I go to the zoo, I'm, people are looking at the animals. I'm looking at the structures. I'm like, that's a good wall. <laughs> like that net, love that glass. <laughs> I've never understood it. Why doesn't a safari sound dangerous to everybody? It's not even a safe web browser. <laughs> you feel me? You ever open up Safari in front of somebody with Firefox? They're like, what the fuck are you doing, man? They make it sound like you just fucked a hooker with no condom. They're like, well, close it, throw it away. Who knows what's in there now? <laughs> it's so wild to me. I'll entertain it. Like, I'll talk to my white friends. Their defenses are so bad. And I'm not saying these are all white people's defenses. I'm saying you wouldn't want to be represented by my white friends. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> the stuff they argue, I go, that's a bad one. They'd be like, just go on a, just go on a Safari. You're going to be fine. I'm like, based on what? They're like, you got a tour guide. I'm like, that nigga's not a wall. <laughs> it's like, what do you think's gonna happen if a lion saw us and was like, oh, I'm about to eat these motherfuckers. You think he's just gonna be coming at y'all and be like, oh shit, they brought the guy. God damn it. <laughs> hey, wrap it up, guys. They brought the fucking guy. <laughs> you don't think the lion just sees more food? That's what I can't get. Like, that's not how your brain works. You think if a lion saw... <laughs> If a lion saw a black tour guide and two white tourists, you don't think he's going, oh shit, dark meat and mashed potatoes? Oh, fuck. Looks like KFC came to me. 
Like, what are we talking about? You know, what do you think the tour guide's gonna do? Entertain him for a second. What do you act? You don't think that's just a guy on the clock? You think that guy actually cares about your livelihood? A lion's coming at y'all, he sees it. You think this dude's just gonna step in the way? Oh, no, 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 lion. No, 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 lion. Not today, lion. You eat zebra, lion. Zebra, black and white. These people, just white, no good. No good, that's why we bring you mixed kid, Blade. Where has Blade gone? <laughs> it's so fucking stupid. <laughs> it just makes me laugh. Like, I'm just fucking around, but you get where I'm coming from, right? Like, you get the point I'm getting at. That's all I'm saying. I just think fear is such a great example for us to explore the concept of privilege, where everybody can see it and realize no one's the villain, but you can identify the differences. I just think it's a great example, you know? Like, I, can I tell you something real wild? I got a wild theory. I think I'm on to something, I just don't know how to prove it. But I, I think I figured something out. I think I know why each race has a different relationship with fear, especially fear for fun. I think I can see what it is. It's kind of a wild theory, but I think I'm on to it. I think if you come from an oppressed group, you've never been so bored with life that you're willing to risk yours. Does that make sense? Like, I don't know Jews that like escape rooms. <laughs> y'all know y'all came to a comedy show, right? Like, I, I'm not running for office. I'm not the guy. I'm just here to make the funny points. I think I'm on some, I don't know Jews that like escape rooms. I don't know black people that are into bondage. <laughs> Whips and chains, you said. Mm. <laughs> Fool me once. <laughs> I don't know any Mexicans that want to do a tough mutter. That's a real good one. Like, if you know what a Tough Mudder is, that's on point. If you don't know what a Tough Mudder is, just so we're on the same page, a Tough Mudder, it's one of those races you do out in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's, a, it's a foot race where you're just going through an obstacle course. You're going through like water hazards, running over hills, running through like electrified fences. I don't know one Mexican who's like, again? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, let's do it. They're like, get the fuck out of here. I did that to get in, not fit in. Fuck out of here, my guy. <laughs> All I'm trying to get at here, I'm not trying to attack anybody, I just want us to understand this concept better so we can get past it, right? Anytime I see somebody online or on TV or wherever say that privilege doesn't exist, I need you to understand, you're not a bad person, but you are wrong, <laughs> all right? I'm not trying to come at you, but you are actually wrong and you sound ridiculous to people who do understand. Just take the time to understand. All right, privilege exists. Bro, I'm a six foot three black man. There's not one person in here that thinks my dick's small. <laughs> That's my privilege. I get big dick privilege. Doesn't matter if you're right or not. You didn't think it. That's my privilege, man. If I was an Asian comic saying all this same shit, you wouldn't have thought the same thing. Beyond, there's not one woman in here who's been at a bar, seen an Asian dude and been like, oh, he might dick me down. <laughs> and he might, he might do it, but you weren't thinking it. That's my privilege. I get big dick privilege. It's a hardship I have to work over every day. <laughs> Trying to overcome. <laughs> but when you say privilege doesn't exist, you know what I always think of? It's always this story, it's such a banana story. When I was a kid, I remember telling my dad what my dream job was, okay? I told him I was five years old, I told him I wanted to be in the NBA. My dad is a, a black man from Alabama in the 1940s, okay? He's not, a, he's not a big dreamer, right? He's a very practical man. His vibe is more like, survive. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's what he's like. And I remember I told him I wanted to be an NBA player. You know what he told me? Just have a backup plan. I was like, God damn, can I dream for a little bit? I'm, I'm five. <laughs> But that's what he felt like he needed to communicate to me based on his experiences in this country as a black man. 
Fair enough. I accept that perspective. I hear you. Meanwhile, my best friend, next door neighbor, I was there when this happened. I remember seeing him tell his dad what he wanted to be. He said that he wanted to be the first black president in U.S. history. You know what his dad told him? Anything you put your mind to, you can achieve. Isn't that beautiful? But that kid was white. <laughs> Don't tell me white privilege doesn't exist, my guy. I, I was there. I saw that shit with my own eyes. I saw this white father, who is a good man, I still talk to him to this day, see his white son look at him and go, I want to be the first black leader of the free world. And with me still in the room, he looks at his son and goes, well, if you just work hard enough. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Tell this kid no. <laughs> Tell him that one's not for him. Couldn't do it. Privilege is just such an interesting topic, and I don't want to harp on it too much longer, but I just want to drive this point home, okay? I do feel like if we're being fair to both sides, there are privileges that white people do get attacked for, and I don't think it's fair. If we're being critical of both sides and we're trying to come together, right? I do think there's one thing I've seen y'all do that I do find very funny, and I hope you find it as funny as I do. And I don't think it's fair that you do get slacked for it. I do think white people are the only race of people that I have seen get offended on behalf of a group they are not a part of. <laughs> like, you know who to picture, right? And that's all I'm saying. But here's the thing, I don't think that's something to attack you for because I believe at its core that's something of goodwill. That just means you, care, you cared for another group of people. You were trying to speak on their behalf because you thought you were doing right by them, right? That's, that's a good thing, that's nothing to attack you for. It may not be the way we want you to do it, but that's okay, right? <laughs> And here's the thing about it, it's, really, it's a really complicated situation because if you look online, you see this happen all the time. White people will do something on behalf of black people. Black people go, don't do that. And then white people go, oh my bad, what would you prefer me do? And black people go, I don't know. <laughs> and then we're just left nowhere. But both of those sides are fair, to be clear. Those are both fair dispositions. Sometimes it's hard to come up with a resolution. You just know when someone isn't doing the right one. That's fair. And it's fair to care and not know what to do. So it still leaves us in the same place of what do you do when you're trying to have someone else's back? I think I came up with something. <laughs> Hear me out here, all right? Listen, I think this is a universal way to show support for a group you're not a part of. You can use this in any group. I don't know anyone who would turn this down. And I don't know what you do after this, but you can always start with this. <laughs> I'll give an example. As a black person, if I'm there, I don't like it when I see somebody white tell somebody else white that they can't say the N-word. Cause that's my line. You feel me? Like, that's what I get to say. Why are you trying to upstage me, man? This is my big moment. You know what I need you to do? I need you to say motherfucker after my line. That's support. You get what I'm saying? Dude, I get to go, you don't get to call me a nigger, and then you come in like, motherfucker, and I'll be like, okay, so now I feel strong. I feel supported. We're a team. You feel what I'm saying? I'm done with allies. Be my motherfucker. I need more of those. That's what I need. Because I don't think there's anything scarier to a racist person than a black man with a white army. He'd be like, oh, fuck, his cause must be good. I think that's actually scary. Stop being my ally. Be my motherfucker. I don't know when I started caring about all this kind of shit. If you saw my show like five years ago, I wasn't talking about nothing like this, you know? I don't know what happens. I got older, I, I don't know, started voting. <laughs> you start voting, you're like, all right, I'm gonna throw some opinions out of here because I'm hearing some wild shit. <laughs> it's weird as you age, the way your priorities change, the way your life changes. I'm not trying to be like, aging sucks. I, I, I'm cool with it, but it, it is weird the ways in which you'll age that you didn't anticipate. Does that make sense? Those are the ones that are weird for me. Like the regular one, like my knees are sore. I gotta wake up early. I'll probably go to a matinee. Like those are the, I'm fine. <laughs> I was ready for that. But the weird ones where I'm like, nobody told me that was part of it. What the fuck is going on with me? Like I heard, the other day I heard a rap song I couldn't relate to one part of. I was like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> That's a weird moment of self-realization. Look, I don't know if you've ever been black before. I've done it my whole life. You know? <laughs> if you hear an entire rap song and you end up going, shit, I don't think any of that was for me. <laughs> what a weird moment in your black existence of like, where do I fit into this? 
I still remember what the guy said. I, I swear to God, I think you'll relate. He, I remember he went, I got an actress on my mattress. I'm going to hit it three times in one night. That's a hat trick. And my brain just went, exhausting. <laughs> That's all I felt. Three times in one night, I was like, not for me. That's crazy. Three times, bro, you don't got work in the morning? <laughs> Nobody's pussy's better than sleep. I'll tell you right now. I... And that's not an attack. The older you get, the truer that rings and you fucking know it. That's not an attack. Ladies, I'm sure your pussy's great. <laughs> sleep is good. I like sleep more than sex and it ain't even close. I know that. You know how I know I like sleep more than sex? I go to sleep every day. I don't miss one. I only have sex sometimes. And even when I have sex, when I'm done, I'm like, God damn, I want to go to sleep. <laughs> if that song was about me, it would have been like, I got an actress on my mattress. I'm going to hit it one time, then I'm napping. That's, the, that's my entire... I'm like, yo, this, hey. <laughs> Trying to hit them NyQuil bars, bro. <laughs> I just think it's so weird to see the things that make you change as you get older. I think it's weird to look at other people your age and see the shit they care about versus the shit you care about. You ever seen that? You're on Facebook and you're like, what are they fucking ranting about? You ever have those moments where like, this is the hill you wanna die on? This is the cause you stand for of all the things? Have you seen this group of people that's trying to get Disney's Snow White canceled? Oh my God, I'm losing my mind over it. There are adults, our eight voters, people whose votes count the same as yours. They're out here trying to bring down a cartoon. They're so dedicated. Have you heard the argument? She never gave consent to the kiss that woke her up. That's what they're arguing. Now listen, I'm not trying to be on the wrong side of an issue. I'm not trying to sound like I got some hot takes. I'm just saying, you've all seen the movie, right? We've all seen Snow White. All I'm saying, <laughs> it really feels like they're leaving out the whole he did it to save her life part, huh? Is that not a crucial detail in the context of that circumstance? Like if you were the prince and that happened to you, wouldn't you want to confront her like, hey, you want to explain the rest of that though so I don't sound like a creep? <laughs> Appreciate that, because you got me out here sounding like Bill Cosby right now. And it, it, I'm just saying that dude was putting them to sleep. I'm just waking them up. This is a totally different thing. <laughs> I don't think you should be allowed to make someone who attempted to save your life out to be a predator. That's the only line in the sand I'm drawing here. I think that deserves to be defended. If I tried to save you, I'm not a creep. When I was a kid, when I was seven, right? I grew up in Tampa. When I was seven, I was at the beach, right? And I remember I was swimming in the ocean. I'm swimming, I'm swimming poorly, if I'm being honest. I'm drowning, let's be honest, I'm drowning. <laughs> I'm for sure drowning. I passed out. I sunk under the water. I had to be saved by a male lifeguard. I shit you not, I woke up on the beach to a male lifeguard giving me mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And when I came to, I completely understood what that situation was. There was no confusion. I wasn't like, oh, nigga, I'll see you in court. Okay. okay. <laughs> you ever heard of Me Too? Well, Me Three now, bro. Uh, just... I just think it's such a weird circumstance to like, this is the hill you want to die on for this argument? I'm not against consent culture. I'm asking, is this where you really want to make your stand? Within this premise? That's what's odd about it to me, you know? Like, have y'all gone back and watched the movie? Like, as adults? It's weird, man. It's real weird. Do you remember what the curse is? True love's kiss will wake her up. That's real specific. Like, they really narrowed down the danger that could have come. You got to be pretty sure to go for it. It's not like they went, hey man, first one to kiss her gets to keep her. <laughs> <laughs> then a bunch of dudes started marching to get to her first. My hoe, my hoe, back up. Okay, you get it. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's just such a weird place to make your argument. And I can understand, to be clear, I can understand where you're coming from if you were just like, I just wish it wasn't a kiss that he had to do to save her. I can appreciate that. I'm just saying, but can you stop making it sound like he, he squeezed the titty when he did it? That's more, <laughs> that's more where I'm coming from, you know? <laughs> I wanna make this very clear, because this is a tricky topic to make jokes about, obviously. At the end of the day, I understand my place within this premise, right? I'm a man lightly making jokes about sexual assault. I understand that. 
And I can never put myself in the position of a woman in relation to a topic like this. I understand that. All I can do is empathize the best I can from the perspective that I have. And that's as a black man in this country. And I'm just saying, as a black man in this country, I don't get what you're talking about. <laughs> Let me say hypothetically, right? Hypothetically speaking, I'm in a coma. I'm dying. And you say the only way to save me is for a white dude to whisper the N-word in my ear. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Here's the kicker, if we're being honest, I don't need him to ask for my permission. My life's on the line. There are bigger priorities at hand. Do what you gotta do. Bro, I don't care if you whisper. Get on all fours for all I care. Nigger! <laughs> Nigger! I'd be like, hey, I heard you the first time, Steve. Goddamn. <laughs> Can you give me a sec to wake up? I take a second. No, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but we're gonna talk about that second one. You don't get to call me two niggers, and then y'all would say, look at my army foreman, dog. Look at us. That's how you fucking do it. That's a weird example. Let me give you a better one. I just wanted to see what you were going to do. Let's say hypothetically, I'm in a coma, and I'm dying. And you say the only way to save me is true love's kiss, just like the movie. I assume y'all would want that handled the exact same way I would want that handled. I would want somebody to go round up everybody in town, form a line, take my weekend at Bernie's body, prop that shit up in a kissing booth, put some cool ass shades on that motherfucker, look back at the line and go, all right, everybody without herpes goes first. You feel me? Is that not what you would want? Like, let's be real for a second. I want to make it very clear. I am not against consent culture. On the contrary, couldn't be more for it. But that's not the place to make your stand. I do think after all of the allegations we've heard from women over the last couple of years, men should be making more of a point to showcase to women how much we do have your backs, how much you are going to see like a change in the behavior you've been encountering, even if we're not the individuals responsible for it. What I'm getting at is that we need to show that we have your backs. You feel me? But the question then becomes, how do we show you that? Here's what I'm pitching. <laughs> Men, start making consent your biggest kink. <laughs> Take a sec, process what I'm saying. Start making consent the kinkiest shit that you're into. Start being a fucking freak for yeses, you feel me? <laughs> Like after the Me Too movement, show them what you've learned. Anytime a woman goes, how do you like it? I'm like, with permission. Like I lean in. I lean in. Bro, I don't unzip it till you say please. You could be like, get over here and fuck me. I'd be like, mm, is that how we ask? <laughs> At this point, having sex with me is like binge watching Netflix. Every so often, I interrupt the flow just to be like, do you still want this? I'm gonna be talking about race. And I never used to have to do that when I came on stage, but over the last couple of years, people get very sensitive if you bring up the issue of race or racism or racial rhetoric. You have people like Lawrence Fox who say stuff like, you know what, maybe if we stop talking about it, it would go away. When has that ever worked for any social ill or personal ailment you've ever had? If you went to a doctor and was like, there's a rash on my genitals, and he said, ignore that shit. You would say, I'd like another doctor, please. I also notice people always say, oh, here we go, you liberals, always whining. First of all, I'm not liberal. I will kick your mum in the face. If you're racist. Second of all, uh, how can you be called a snowflake if you're liberal or care about other people? Like, when you think about the nature of a snowflake, you can't describe me in that way. Like, what's a snowflake? Individual, white and cold as fuck, <laughs> and tend to disappear in warm climates when black people are having a good time. <laughs> Couldn't be further from the truth. But mainly when I try to talk about issues that affect this society where race is concerned, people say, oh, 
you seem very angry. You must have a chip on your shoulder. And I thought a lot about this chip on my shoulder. And in this world of body positivity, when we're embracing all of our curves and our flaws, I embrace having a chip on my shoulder as a black man in a racist society. <laughs> keeps me alert, keeps me alive, keeps me working for a better world. And I'm gonna share this lovely chocolate chip of mine with you guys. So I hope you're ready for some lovely social commentary cookies. <laughs> now, I'm calling them social commentary cookies, yes. I could call them home truths, but that tends to put people off when you tell them the truth. You know why? Because normally you go on a website and at the beginning it doesn't say, hey, we're gonna put a piece of coding into your computer so we can monitor all of your browsing activity and sell your data to other houses and maybe, you know, keep that for ourselves. Because we'd go, oh, I don't consent to this. That's kind of invasive. No, thank you. So instead you go on websites and they go, hey, you like cookies? And we go, yeah, we love cookies. Give me some cookies now. So I wanted to brace you for that. Because I get called an angry person all the time. I don't think I'm angry all the time. Just certain situations will bring out anger in anybody. Now, I know it's a comedy show and I don't want to start on a solemn tone, but I've got to tell you what happened. Um, I was attacked last week. And you don't expect to be attacked in the place you've grown up your whole life. There I was, around the corner from my own mother's house. And she lives in a leafy suburb. I did not expect this to happen. But something or someone hits the back of my head. And before I could think, I've got a warm, wet liquid trickling down the back of my neck. And I thought, please don't be what I think it is. But there we were, a pigeon shit on me. <laughs> Has this ever happened to anybody else? Yeah, it's not a nice thing to happen. But was it made worse when somebody went, don't worry, that's good luck. I'm sorry, when did feces and fortune become bedfellows? There's nothing lucky about shit. In fact, shit is the opposite of luck. When you're not lucky, you go, ah, oh, shit. Now, I think we can test this theory. Anyone here ever bought a lottery ticket or a scratch card? Yeah, hoping to be lucky. Yeah, but you didn't wipe your bum with it before the numbers came out. Because there's nothing lucky about shit. Nothing lucky about being shat on. Now, I want to make sure we've made the distinction between the words shit and shat. Because those carry two very different meanings. Because if someone says to you, hey, I shit in your house, you'd be like, okay, bit too much information. You can just say I go into the toilet. Anyway, that's fine. I hope you've washed your hands. But if someone says, hey, I shat in your house, there's a feeling that's still there. Now you gotta buy a new rug. <laughs> and get some new friends. So anyway, this pigeon shit on me, I was pissed off. And I decided to declare war on this pigeon and all of his kind. But then I thought, what a hypocrite. You can't blame an entire group or community for the actions of an individual. I'm not Liam Neeson or a metropolitan police officer. So, can't do that. So I thought the best thing to do would be to empathize and think about myself as a pigeon. And when I thought about it, you know what? Pigeons have a rough time in our society. Some of you might remember that pigeons used to exchange messages during the war. You know, when people ate licorice still. And they would exchange messages between the allies, helping us to defeat the Nazis. I say defeat, making a move to America. But the point is that pigeons helped out. Now, Pigeons live like war veterans. They got limbs missing, no access to healthcare. They're homeless, congregating under bridges. It's tough when you're a pigeon. Not only that, when you're a pigeon, you're considered a second class citizen to your white counterpart, the dove. Did you even know that doves are just white pigeons? And they get all the good songs, all for the wings of a dove, when doves cry. There's no good pigeon songs. Black people are like, there's one pigeon song. It's not positive. <laughs> and speaking from personal experience, when you've contributed to the infrastructure of a society and that society turns around and neglects your efforts, sometimes you gotta do wild shit so people pay attention. Maybe that's why that pigeon shouted me. <laughs> and then when he went back to the Black Birds Matter rallies, they had a conversation about it. Because I assume all the Black Birds kind of get together 
one of the more radical birds takes the stage. We'll call him Falcon X. And no one else is doing bird pan-Africanist punch. Shut up. So anyway, Falcon X comes on stage and he's like, this is some bullshit. I'ma keep shitting on them until they stop eating our eggs. Then one of the more moderate pigeons will call him Martin Koo, the king. He, He's like, not all human beings are bad. Sometimes when you go to the park, they will give you breadcrumbs. And he's like, they also take breadcrumbs and they roll our legs in that and they fucking eat it. What are you talking about, mine? <laughs> like, even the fact that we call pigeons flying rats, which is a derogatory term only to the black urban pigeons, mind you. Because when it comes to rats, there's also iniquity there. When you're a white rat, I'm not saying your life is perfect, but it could be worse. You get to work in a lab, free cosmetics, healthcare, exercise in a maze. When you're a black rat, what do you get? Blame for the plague. Or if you're a brown rat, you gotta do youth work in a sewer, teaching turtles kung fu and shit. That's no kind of life. Doesn't just happen on land either. This shit is taking place in the sea too. Some of you will be familiar with the species Orcus orca known in documentaries as the blackfish, but more commonly known as a killer whale. All these fish in the sea and the predominantly black one is called a killer. Is that fair? Why can't they be called sea pandas? I'm just saying that killer whales look more like pandas than sea lions look like lions. Like think about how we revere and look at lions. King of the savannah plains. Even lion kings. There's no sea lion king, cause they don't look like a fucking lion. Can you imagine the first time a kid was told they was gonna meet an underwater lion? How disappointing that would have been. <laughs> Marine Byler just comes home, he's like, hey there, son. I know I haven't been around as much as I should have been, but daddy's got a surprise for you. We finally discovered a new species, a sea lion, son. Dad, are you fucking serious? You guys have discovered a motherfucking sea lion? I don't really care for your language, son, but yeah, that's <laughs> my fault for not being there, I guess. But yeah, son, that's what happens. So now they get down to the lab and he's like, behold, son, in all of nature's majesty, a sea lion. Kid's like, what the fuck is this? It's a sea lion, son. It's an otter with a fucking wax. You should have called it a sea badger. Don't you get tired of disappointing me, motherfucker? <laughs> Meanwhile, the biggest killer in the sea gets to enjoy the name Great White Shark. And all we do is talk about its greatness and its whiteness. Should be called a colonial fish, if you ask me. Out here just taking over. So when David Attenborough's on Blue Planet, he's like, since ancient times, the Great White Shark has been one of history's greatest hunters and most efficient killers. But we want to know. What's its secret? Oh, I know. Privilege! <laughs> now you can tell me, guys, did that seem kind of angry? Yeah. yeah, a little bit. Well, that's fine. Some of you say yeah, some of you say no. Well, I'll put that down to the fact that rarely do black people in our community get to explore the entirety of our emotional spectrum. It's not just from zero to anger all the time. There's a sliding scale. Also, just because we raise our voices doesn't mean we're angry. If you learn nothing else today, moving forward, think of black shouting the same way you think about white women's tears. In that sometimes when we do it, we're in a good mood. And also sometimes it's the only recourse of action you have for people to pay attention to your needs. And finally, black people and white women telling us to calm down does not help. Yeah. So now you have that understanding, let me give you an idea of the sliding scale. We all get angry sometimes. And I don't go from zero to 10, it's a scale. So like one for me would be like, you know when you go into a room in the dark or you're not looking and you stub your toe on some furniture, but it's so painful, you're like, someone is trying to kill me in my own home. <laughs> Cause once I went into my nephew's bedroom, he had a Buzz Lightyear on the floor, I stepped on it and I was so angry. I was like, I wish this was Toy Story and you could come to life. Cause I fucking kill you, Buzz. <laughs> Right, to show you halfway up the scale, 
I have a condition called misphonia. It means certain sounds make me very sensitive, like snoring or loud chewing. And I'm telling you this because I had to move out of my housemate's flat. I was living with a housemate, I had to find my own flat because this guy would make so much noise when he was eating because he refused to go to the dentist. I would fantasize about slitting his throat so he could bleed out all over the table. Now, be honest with me, guys. Does that seem kind of dramatic? Some say yeah, some say no. To those of you that say yeah, let me ask you a question. Who the fuck chews soup? <laughs> My housemate, that's fucking who. Yeah. Now, I wanted to give you an idea of what makes me angry. And I'm imagining some of you are like, well, based on what he's saying, then racism must be level 10 for Dane. But you'd be incorrect. Most people of color can tell you we are so used to discrimination, it's become part of the atmosphere. It's something you have to consider in every activity you do. Anything you do, you've got to think about how it's going to affect you as a person of color in Western civilization. So I would say, no, racism is not a 10 for me. It's more like an 8 or a 9. 10 for me would be people still denying that racism exists. And those people are still out there. And some of them are black and brown people too, trying to find work and avoid getting shape ups at barbershops. The point is, <laughs> thank you black people that got that shit. <laughs> but the point is that, you know, can we still deny the existence of racism in a post camera phone society, in a world where there are two men called Rage Charles and Stevie Wonder, who between both those guys have written at least three songs about racism. So if a blind man can see it, it must really exist. Some of you are like, but my brown friend says, your brown friend can't play the piano with his fucking eyes closed. So I know that the conversation about privilege is a hard one to have, because you live in a capitalist society where you're told you've got to work for everything, be a part of this rat race, and for you to win, someone lazier than you has to lose. You've all got the same 24 hours. <laughs> right, to get out there and do some work. So if it's gonna ease this conversation somewhat, I am now on stage prepared to discuss some aspects of black privilege. Would you like that? Well, it don't fucking exist. How dare you? Let's nice try, lady. I laid the trap. You sprung it. Did you see that shit? Everyone I know is angry, really. I mean, everyone, everyone I've ever met, especially in New York City, is angry. No. We're all, yes. I saw a two-year-old throw a fit in CVS today, and he just got to this planet. <laughs> He's got no bills, no kids, no responsibilities, and he's still like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> Open a register. <laughs> Anybody here in therapy? Yeah, over there. Where you? Oh, good for you, is it working? Oh, good. I feel like the only reason you feel good in therapy is because you're on a couch. <laughs> therapy, yeah, I don't know. If I do see a therapist, I'm going to see a female therapist. I think they're the best. Yeah, I do. I, think, I, I, I just think women are better at talking about feelings and emotions and ideas and all that stuff. I've been around guys my whole life. I don't trust them. <laughs> Certainly don't trust them with my feelings. I'm sure there's hundreds of great male therapists out there, but I'm terrified I'd go to a male therapist and say something like, I'm scared, and he'd be like, I'm scared. <laughs> oh, I'm scared, I'm Nick. Look at me. I don't know, it's just men. Men are not good with their feelings. We're just not, it's not a big deal. It's not a huge deal, you know, but we're just not. Feelings are like, feelings are like crayons. They give you 64, but you only end up using like three. <laughs> I use like, <laughs> I use like three feelings. Anger, despair, nothing. <laughs> and nothing's the big one. Nothing's the big one. I can't tell you how many times uh, someone's told me a long story and at the end of it they say, isn't that sad? And I'm like, I don't know. 
Sort of. It was long. Maybe that was it. I was talking to my buddy. He told me he was horny. I said nothing. <laughs> telling someone you're horny is like telling them you have diarrhea. There's not a lot to add. Should have taken care of that before you left the house, I guess. I don't know what to tell you. That's what he said to me. I'm horny. What did he think I was going to say? Oh, all right. Come here. Let's get this over with. You owe me. You shouldn't tell people you're horny. I mean, you tell your lover or your partner or whatever, that's fine, but you don't tell some guy you're horny. <laughs> you don't just tell some guy you're horny, you know? You're not going to get sympathy, right? You get no sympathy for being horny. It's not like you're sick. You can't call in horny to work. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not coming in today. No, I'm really horny. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't want to give it to everyone else. No, I already tried that. <laughs> and I'm not stupid. I know there's more to life than just sex. We all know there's more to life than just sex. It's just that sex is so much better than those other things. There's other stuff, but it's so much better. It's dominating. I mean, I love cookies. I do, I love cookies. But if I do not have access to cookies, I will not download a movie and watch two other people eat cookies. <laughs> Or will I? <laughs> yeah. I think it's the word, horny. It's just, it's not a pleasant word, is it? Horny. It just feels aggressive. I should have called it something nicer. Extra lonely. Sad in the pants. <laughs> I, I'm shocked that hasn't caught on. Sad in the pants, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Would make those late night phone calls less sleazy. Can I come over? Why? <laughs> Sad in the pants. <laughs> I think some of you are hesitant to laugh at the horny material. Yeah, because of the times we live in with all the sexual misconduct going on, which isn't funny, which isn't cool. All the perverts. Seems like every time you open up the newspaper, there's a new pervert. Yeah, I used to think I knew what a pervert was, but with all this information going around, I finally looked the word up. You know what a pervert is? A pervert is a guy. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, yeah. <laughs> Just a guy with an idea. <laughs> Guys are not doing well right now. Guys are not gonna make the playoffs. <laughs> right, it's just not good. Just look at the news, it's all guys. They shouldn't even call it the news. They should call it shit guys did today. <laughs> And now Susie with the weather. Don't touch her! A lot of couples, that's good. Love. I'm in a relationship. I'm in a relationship, I am cautiously optimistic. Which means I'm divorced. Are you divorced over there? Divorced? You're divorced? Oh, you're just happy I am, all right. You usually don't get that kind of support. Yeah, for those of you who don't know what divorce is, um, 
Divorce is when the person who knows you better than anyone in the entire world thinks you suck. <laughs> They've done the research. And it's a big thumbs down. <laughs> anyway, um, that's all beyond, behind me, right? I'm in this relationship. Uh, it's going okay. Uh, she's smart and funny. Of course, everybody says that about their partner, don't they? He's smart and funny. She's smart and funny. No one's ever like, I'm dating a sad moron. <laughs> Woo, it's tough. <laughs> she is smart, though. She's got a master's in business, a um, doctorate in engineering, and a law degree. Wow. Yeah, but I feel like we balance each other out. <laughs> so... <laughs> I ground her. Uh, I don't know. I love her. Um, my buddy said, how do you know you love her? I'm like, I don't know. What do I got to convince you to? <laughs> He is right on some level. You can't be positive you love somebody. You think you love somebody. You tell people you love them, but you don't, there's no way to confirm it, right? There's no, there's no test. There's no breathalyzer for love. That'd be nice. Someone trying to get over on you. I love you. Oh, really? Blow into this. We have a realistic kind of love. We don't have that Hollywood kind of romantic comedy, everything is gonna be fine kind of love, right, you know? Matter of fact, we were watching a movie the other night and um, The Rock was in it and he turns to the woman in the movie and he's like, I'm not gonna let anyone hurt you, ever. <laughs> and then she looks at me and I'm like, well, you know. <laughs> Certainly do what I can, but uh, I'm scared too. I just don't want to date anymore. <laughs> Big thumbs down on dating. <laughs> Cause I'm old, I've been doing it forever. It's too emotionally exhausting. That's the big problem. It's emotionally exhausting being in love. Like right? when you try to find out, when you try to meet somebody, cause what is dating? Dating is basically one person walking into a room and saying to another person, huh? <laughs> Not bad, right? <laughs> and, how <do> you <laughs> and how do you figure out if you like somebody? You go to a comedy show, you have drinks. You go to dinner, you have drinks. You go out for drinks, you have more drinks. <laughs> of course you're gonna think you like the other person, you're hammered. <laughs> but you don't learn anything about the person. You say the right thing, wear the right thing. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> Then six months later, you find out they're a creep. I don't have that kind of... T I think all first dates should be in your underpants on a couch at 7 a.m. with all your medications in front of you. Yeah. Yes. You got diabetes. I got depression. Let's do this. I don't know. I really don't. Uh, dating. I don't even know. I just with the sex too, and that's hard. It's difficult to say. I don't even have that many. Uh, I don't have as many sexual thoughts as I used to. I don't know what happened. I think my porn director in my head is so exhausted from his early work that. Uh, <laughs> He's just showing clips from the Great British Baking Show right now. <laughs> Somehow it works. So anyway, seeing this woman, she wants to get married. I want her to stop wanting that. <laughs> it's not that I don't want to get uh, married again, it's that I don't want to get Divorced again, exactly! I don't want to get divorced again. I don't, two divorces is a bad look. I'm sorry if you've been divorced twice, but it just doesn't look good getting divorced. <laughs>
getting divorced. <laughs> You, uh, you get a divorce once, people are like, oh, that's too bad. You get divorced a second time, they're like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> what are you saying to these people? <laughs> if this one doesn't work out, though, I'm done. I'm retiring. I'm taking the penis off, put it in the closet next to the Peloton and <laughs> that book I never read. And <laughs> You got to give it up, though. You can't, you just got to throw your hands up and just wish for the best. I think that's all you can do. So, yeah, sometimes you get married, you get divorced. Sometimes you get married, you get divorced. Sometimes you get married and that person kills you. <laughs> That's gotta be the worst. <laughs> what are the chances you marry somebody and they kill you? <laughs> it's gotta be a weird feeling. They're coming at you with a knife. You're like, wow, was I off. The first place I left, uh left Asia too, and then more as an adult, uh, I got a job in, in uh, Germany, in Berlin, in Germany. I moved there uh, as an immigrant, but I didn't know German, so a lot of the friends that I made uh, were English-speaking expats from other developed countries. And it's a very subtle difference, you know, between an immigrant and an expat. You know, the easy way to say it is that immigrants are brown and black and expats are white, but that's too simple. <laughs> it's too simple, it really is. You met a, ever met a Polish person? They get sad too. It is. <laughs> Uh, you need to ask someone why they moved to a place to really know, you know. An immigrant will say something like, you know, uh, I moved here because I got a job, or I was trying to get out of a bad situation back home, and I just wanted an easier life for myself, or an easier life for my family. And an expat will say some shit like, I just heard the vibe was really chill. Just <laughs> you know, you know, some nonsense like that with a big smile on the face as fuck. Yeah. Now I've caught wind though that immigrants become somewhat of a trendy word that rich white people in developed countries want to take from themselves because they can't let us have anything, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I've met people from uh, the US and Australia that have moved to the UK and like to call themselves immigrants. And that, that's fine, you know, they're not wrong, they're within their rights to do so. But I feel like that's the same as if Elon Musk, a white guy from South Africa, moved to America like he did and started calling himself African American. <laughs> It's technically correct. <laughs> but it just don't feel right, do it? It's... <laughs> oh. Now you can tell talking to people. I, I remember soon after I moved to Berlin, I was out just trying to make friends. I didn't know a single person in this goddamn country. Uh, I met this guy from, he was from Sweden. And we got to talking, and he was like, yeah, you know, Berlin is, is really nice, so vibrant, so multicultural. Uh, it's, it's another thing about expats, they like to have black and brown people in the background, but not be friends with any. Uh, we're like houseplants, we add to the atmosphere, you know? It's so vibrant, so multicultural. <laughs> That's what that means. <laughs> but, but the water is very hard in Berlin. And I just moved from Sri Lanka, all right? This was the first time in my life I had heard of the concept of hard water. You know, I thought the categories were drinkable and not drinkable. <laughs> uh, I just met the guy, I was trying to make a new friend, so I just went along with it. I was like, yeah, man, I get it. Oh, I can relate. The, <laughs> the water is very heavy back home, too, because we got rocks in it, you know? Same, same, but different. It's, <laughs> It was such a party city, really. It took a long time for me to get used to it. You know, these people treat partying like it's a, it's a full-time job. I swear, I had a day off work on a Wednesday, and I messaged a friend like, hey, man, you want to get lunch or something? And he replied, nah, sorry, bro. I have an orgy to be at. You know how it is. <laughs> and I can't say I do. Uh, first of all, terrible at multitasking, but mostly. Mostly just something about the idea of being me alone, in a room full of Europeans holding whips and chains. <laughs> Just historically speaking, I did not feel like it was the best life decision. But, but he was very nice, he tried to convince me to come along anyway. He was like, come on man, it's on a boat. That's even worse. <laughs> ah, wow. Uh, That is probably how they got them the first time. All right, this is why. <laughs> so I went. 
<laughs> it's very interesting. It's not like you just show up and people are just having sex as soon as you get there. You know, I remember I went into a, a dark basement type room, something like this. Uh, <laughs> there were just, just Germans marching in unison to techno music around me. And this was supposed to be a good time, apparently. Uh, you know, I just went along with it. Uh, but the only problem was that I, I just hate this music so much. It's, it's lack of rhythm offends me on a cultural level. It's, you know, I mean, electronic music is nice when you're on drugs, but also everything is nice when you're on drugs. That's what, <laughs> that's what drugs are for. But then I, I looked around and I realized what had really happened here, why Germany loved electronic music so much. And I was impressed. I, I realized that Germany heard that the rest of the world thinks that white people don't know how to dance. So they decided to make their favorite kind of music something you don't need to dance to. This is... <laughs> This is genius. This is what Europe has done for centuries. Whenever they're losing, they don't get better. They just move the goalposts. <laughs> you know, electronic music is just the Winter Olympics of music. That's what it is. <laughs> they thought they were good at sports and then they started letting black people compete and were like, nah, we need snow immediately. <laughs> yeah. We need to hit the slopes right away. <laughs> It was a real fun place to live, though. It was a very easy country to live in. By far, the most difficult part about living in Germany were uh, the Germans. They are really the worst. They, if they could all just leave, it would be... <laughs> no, they were just very rude, and it's something I'm not used to. You know? But I came to respect it after a while. I came to respect it because I know now that rude people are the sign of a strong economy. That's... <laughs> as their way of telling the rest of the world that they don't need you because I say Sri Lanka for example I, I meet people that visit Sri Lanka and come back all the time and they'll tell me how beautiful it was they'll say it was so, so beautiful such a beautiful place but more than anything else the people were, were the, so lovely they're the nicest kindest most hospitable people I've met in my entire life and I'm just thinking yeah that's because they need your tourist money you idiot <laughs> Uh, our kindness is a hustle, all right? That's what it is. If we were half as nice to each other as we are to tourists, I would still be at home. That's... <laughs> we have all sorts of hilarious cottage ind industries around the island. We'll do anything for a buck. We have, my favorite is we have a very funny industry of, of straight male prostitutes in the southern part of the island. Uh, they're called beach boys. You'll find them uh, in the south uh, uh, along a beach. First, you have to look for like an older European divorcee. Uh, <laughs> you can't tell someone's a divorcee by looking at them. But you can though, you know, like, there's lots of li linen and flowy scarves, that's the vibe. Uh, and the guys are usually sort of very surfer looking guys, uh, and they'll just usually partner up with them. Sometimes they'll even go home and get, uh, go home back to Europe with them and get married, it's, it's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great scam, it's amazing. <laughs> and the guys are usually very surfer looking guys, you know, like darker skin, uh, longer hair, and <laughs> I'm just saying, if this comedy shit don't work out, I got options, all right? I've been, I've been a whore for free for most of my life. I might as well go pro. This is... I feel like the same thing doesn't quite happen here, though. Like, you, you don't get that much sex tourism in the UK. You don't get women from other parts of the world flying into, into the UK and going to a tour of Weatherspoons in Bolton. <laughs> cruising for a builder named Raj. It just doesn't work out. Like <laughs> I started doing comedy there, and that was really nice. You know, that, this is really the first thing I've done in my life that I feel like is for me. Uh, the only problem was, it was exhausting. I, I still work a full-time job. Uh, I was at the time, and I work all day and do this at night. Uh, I was just, you know, like, this sitting down thing is not a part of the act. I'm just tired. <laughs> You know how exhausting it is being this exceptional? Right? I'm 27 years old, you look in my eyes, that's a 72-year-old man looking back at you. <laughs> but a lot of the people I started comedy with, uh, I just noticed that they had a lot more free time, they were a lot more chill. A lot of them didn't work uh, jobs even. I wondered how that was working. And uh, they just said like, no, you know, we, we, if you're European or from uh, other countries, you can just claim unemployment uh, and you get a check every month and that's all right. And I was just, I was a very jealous, resentful young man at the time. I was just mad that I had to work so hard my whole life to have access to this life and these people got it just by default. Uh, so much so that I looked it up and apparently Berlin had a 10% unemployment rate, 10%, that's three times Germany's national average. And then I was wondering, how is this even economically possible? Like who's supporting all these people, some of which are choosing not to support themselves? And then I remembered that 60% of my salary that 
wasn't actually my salary. I was like, oh shit, am I supporting these European kids' dreams? Is this a, is this a reverse Angelina Jolie situation? What is happening? You know, I, I understand that high taxes are a big part of the reason that life in a country like that is so nice, but a warning would have been cool. You know? <laughs> I remember the day I got my first paycheck there. Uh, I read the first line with the total amount, and that was more money than I had seen in my entire life before that point in one place. And then I read the second line about how much they took away and realized that in one day I had more money taken away from me <laughs> than I'd ever seen in my entire life before that point. It was very conflicting. I didn't know whether I'd be happy or safe. I felt like I'd been blindfolded and given the greatest blowjob of my life and later found out it was by a raccoon. I didn't even... I didn't... For my conscience, I need y'all to know that that joke doesn't make sense. Uh, and it only works because raccoons are inherently humorous creatures. <laughs> Yeah. I was dating a lot when I was there. German girls were far more practical than I expected. Uh, this one girl, we got together towards the beginning of winter and she broke up with me towards the beginning of summer. It turns out she was just in it for the body heat. Uh, that's not even the worst one. This other girl, we, uh, she was real smart. She was getting her, uh, doing her PhD at the time, you know, writing her thesis. Uh, I used to like her a lot. She used to ask very interesting, insightful questions about Sri Lanka, about my culture, about where I'm from. And it made me feel very special until I found out she was writing her thesis in South Asian studies? <laughs> and I found it. I found it and I read it and everything I said was referenced to native number four. How many? How many innocent ethnic men I had this mo this Uh, I felt bad for how good my life was there, you know, because you never quite completely forget where you came from. And this whole time that I'm living away from home, uh, I'm aware of how hard it is for people back home. And I'm just out here in Europe doing comedy and going to orgies and shit. I felt like a selfish person. Uh, I really think I have, you know, the UK is a very conservative country. A lot of people here are very afraid of immigrants. And speaking as an immigrant, y'all should be more afraid. Like, we are... <laughs> We're the worst. We really are. We're the most selfish people from our respective places. We're the ones that left everyone else behind on purpose. <laughs> Think about what kind of a sociopath you need to be. To, like, you're born in your place. Uh, uh, it's a little rough, but it's home. You know, your, your friends you grew up with, your family, everyone you've ever loved is from this place. But you're like, nah, fuck all of these people. I want Amazon Prime. I'm leaving. I'm too good for this. <laughs> I'm a dad now, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've been a dad for a long time. My son is really here. My son is 17 years old, and he's here with, at the show, like, he's got a wristband on, and they were like, don't let him drink. Um, my son is, yeah, I have a 17-year-old kid, it's crazy. I'm, I, 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 it's so nuts having a teenager. I wanted a teenager. The entire time I was, I had him young, and the whole time he was growing up, I was like, I want a fucking teenager. Because the whole time he's been growing up, everybody's like, where do you have a teenager, Ben? Where do you get to the teenage years? <laughs> yeah, where do you get to the teenage years? Kids these days, they're fucking different. <laughs> That's what everybody says, they're fucking different. I have a teenager now, and I'm here to tell you all, they're not any fucking different. <laughs> they're the exact same fucking things they've always been. It's crazy. In fact, my son, when he was turning 14, I remember this vividly. I went to him and I was like, hey, dude, what do you want to do for your 14th birthday? And he was like, Psh, I don't know. And I was like, make it cheap. Let's not go. I thought he wanted to go to like a gaming cafe or to race drones or do something futuristic. And he was like, no, you know what, dad? Honestly, I just think me and my friends want to go roller skating. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, I just think we want to go roller skating. And I was like, that's a... That's the most American teenage thing ever. What one of us as teenage kids didn't go roller skating when we were in middle school or whatever? Look at you, even you, felon looking guy. You're like, yeah, fuck yeah, I roller skated. It's crazy. It's, we all did it. And do you not, you wanna know what my son and his dork friends did at that roller skating <laughs> rink? Do you wanna know? They fucking roller skated. Do you know what I've never done? 
In the hundreds of times I went to a roller skating rink between the ages of 11 and 13 years old, I'd never put on a pair of roller skates once. <laughs> I used to just stand in front of the door of Happy Wheels Skate Center and rip Marlboro Mediums one right after the other and plan my next fire. That's all I did. I'd just stand up front in a Def Leppard shirt and be like, we're gonna burn down Carl's Tuff Shed after this, right? But my son and his friends, they actually skated. They played the claw game. They had pizza, it was adorable. And you're all like, Ben, how do you know that he actually did that? Because he's a teenager, you can't trust him. Oh, I'll tell you how I know. He invited me! <laughs> My fucking teenage son invited his dad to go roller skating with him at his birthday party. He was like, Dad, do you wanna come along to my birthday party? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Daddy wants to go skating. <laughs> You'd have me? And he's like, as long as you don't call yourself Daddy for the rest of the afternoon. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I guess your generation has ruined the word, haven't you? <laughs> He's like, are you crying? And I was like, I've been to jail. <laughs> and I was like, my dad would, I would have never invited my, my parents anywhere. <laughs> like I would have never, and he invited me and it was so cool. And I was like, fuck, I'm going roller skating with my boy. Oh, what am I gonna wear? Like that's a big thing. And I was so fucking pumped. And I'm like, what are we gonna do? And he was like, dad, why are you so, psyched to go roller skating. And I was like, kiddo, I used to roller skate as a kid. I haven't been into one of those shits in like 26 years. I can't wait to go inside that building and see all the cool ways in which they've updated it. <laughs> and all of you that are laughing are laughing because you know that hasn't fucking happened at all. I walked in the door and I was like, holy fuck! And he was like, what? And I'm like, it's exactly as we left it! And he was like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure my joint is still behind the locker. It's a fucking time capsule! In fact, I've become totally convinced that there is only one contracting company on the planet that has the license to build every roller skating rink on the planet in perpetuity forever, right? Like if your town wants a roller skating rink, you just call this company up and a pot-bellied guy in a hard hat shows up and he's like, hey man, what's going on? Someone said you all wanted to put up a roller skating rink up here or what? I'm like, yep, right on, man. You want me to build you a squat, windowless cement building set back in a dirt parking lot that looks totally out of place in your town? Yeah, that sounds about right. Right on, cool, man. You want me to carpet that thing on the inside with wall the fucking wall? Uh, yeah, I think I do. Right on, man. You want me to carpet the fucking walls? <laughs> Fuck yeah, I want you to carpet the fucking walls. I want to get a rug burn on my elbows if I'm just walking somewhere with poop. Why are the walls always carpeted? No one has ever asked that question. What a weird, weird design thing. And everyone, it's uniform. It's just like, do, do roller skating rinks turn into the creepiest BDSM clubs after hours? Like at two in the morning, are there just fucking cable executives cheese grating their balls on the fucking wall? And I had forgot that roller skating is a fucking enigma. It's one of the weirdest, weirdest pastimes on the planet. Because if you think about it, it's one of the few pastimes on the planet where if you're really, really, really fucking good at it, it sort of creeps everybody the fuck out. <laughs> And 
And if you aren't laughing at that, that's because you're an adult who roller skates and you're a fucking creep is what you are. Don't think I don't see you down there. Now listen, I do want to say this. It is totally sexist. This is a very real sexist divide. If you're a woman and you can roller skate, it's kind of hot. Like, it is kind of hot. I kind of like, it's fine, it's fine. You get out there, a little disco music, you know, it's, it's hot. But if you're just an adult dad, like, think about it, say you're, say, say this, say you're having a birthday party for a little kiddo and it's a softball game, right? And you're the dad that shows up and every time you're up to the plate, you're like, all right, kids, back up. Mr. Roy's at the plate now. And you're just cranking home runs over the fence. Do you think anybody is bummed about that? No, no one is upset. All the other kids are like, holy fucking shit. He just hit that in the fucking road. I don't know why this kid has a thick Boston accent. It's an odd character choice. Or say you're having a bowling party and you're the dad that shows up and without even trying, you just lay out a 270 without even blinking. You think anybody's bummed about that? No, no, all the other dads are watching you bowl this game from their area and they're like, holy shit. Honey, that's his eighth strike in a row. Hey, you know what, bud? Fuck my wife. I want you to fuck my wife. I want you to raise my son. Cause you're more of a man than I'll ever fucking be. Did you just bowl a 258 on an amateur lane? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> but if you have a roller skating party and everybody arrives and you're the dad that's already there before anybody gets there. And when they come in, they get to the rink and you just come whipping around the corner backwards. And you cross in front of that open area and you're like, everybody lace up, couple skate starts in three songs. And you're doing that weird sideways crotch buffet as you go by. All of a sudden, everybody in the building is like, hey, did you know that Ted's a sex offender? I had, I had no fucking clue, I didn't. I didn't see that coming. He works for the state. They're not doing background checks anymore, huh? Oh, fuck. Yeah, look at that. He's skating backwards again. Okay, you know what, kiddos? Uh, we're gonna stay away from old fields on wheels for the rest of the year. Well, I don't know. It just looks like your Uncle Ted is working through a few things out there. You all know that guy. We used to go to a roller skating rink. There'd be 130 tweens out there on the fucking roller skating rink and then just one 40 year old dude fucking ripping it up. You can't feel it. It's electric. Boogie, 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 boogie. And then he crosses in front and does this shit where he gets low and then he... One of you assholes in here does that. <laughs> you think it's funny. You're sitting here laughing. You're like, yeah, that's me. I skate well. But little do you know, you are playing with fucking fire. Because if you don't know it, let me tell you all, if you're an adult male over the age of 35 years old, and you turn a corner at a roller skating rink by crossing one skate over the other as you go around that corner, you are automatically a level two sex offender in the state of Colorado. Yeah, you now have to register with your neighbors when you move into an area. You wanna be a dad who roller skates? Get your ass out, grab the railing, pull yourself along the wall. No one is scared of this guy. Hi guys, hi. This is a book called The Lunchbox Surprise, and it's not for sale, but I wrote an alternative ending to The Lunchbox Surprise, and I'm gonna share it with you tonight, but I wanted to tell you this. I did this joke forever in the 90s, and then the illustrator and the author of The Lunchbox Surprise contacted me and said, hey, here's another surprise. <laughs> 
we don't like you doing this, but... <laughs> so now I'm going to go ahead, and this is how it starts, I swear. It's time for lunch, it's time to eat, the teacher says, now take your seat. All right, that starts off nicely, you know. <laughs> My lunch is best, say Jan and Pam. I'm going to call BS right off the bat. <laughs> On Jan and Pam, I haven't seen anybody's lunch. I don't know how many kids are in the class. It's like, calm down, Jan and Pam. Let's see how this thing plays out, you know? I'm going to skip ahead because it does read a little long. Jan has peanut butter, bread, and jam. All right, that sounds pretty good, you know? Okay. Dan has soup. Or no, I'm sorry, Pam has soup, Dan has ham. I'm giving it to Dan, man. I mean, he's, he's packing the animal protein. Max has chicken, rice, and peas. I'm guessing Max is Mediterranean. I don't know. Just saying. I'm just saying, I hope he has his paperwork in order. You know? But Sam has nothing, not a spot. Sam has nothing his mom forgot. I know. It takes a weird turn, man. I'm like, what is Sam's mom getting into that she sent an empty lunchbox to school? That's the story I want to read. Sam is surprised. Sam is sad. Sam is hungry. Sam is mad. I don't blame him. I'd be mad too, you know? Now, here's the part I wrote. <laughs> Sam's mom is a witch and that's no lie if he keeps missing lunch he's gonna die hey thank you so much so much fun thanks for supporting my party